think so. Yeah, hi everybody. Today we're going to be continuing our uh, introduction to software testing lecture. And uh, what we'll begin talking about today is the, uh, the different levels and types of testing before we talk about the, um, before we talk about the, uh, the different coverage criteria uh, or the definition of coverage criteria uh, uh, and then the different definitions of faults and errors and failures. Okay, so let's begin. So first, two types of testing that you, you hear quite a lot from in, in the industry is uh, black box testing and white box testing. And uh, the concept of black box testing is that I'm gonna treat the system as a black box, okay, self-explanatory in the sense that I am not gonna bother looking on what's inside this item that I'm gonna be actually testing, okay? I'm gonna be treating it like a black box, like a shoe box, okay? Um, so my source for the input is based on my understanding of the requirements. As you can see, the arrow coming in from the top. Uh, so the requirements, it tells me and explains to me what is it that this system is expected to do. And along with it, I start to come up with test cases, which is ultimately just a situation of creating a set of inputs and figuring out what is the expected output. Uh, but that's basically the definition of black box testing. It's very, very simple type of testing. Uh, you don't really need a bachelor's degree in order to do a uh, black box testing. Uh, and the industry is quite often to hire people with a two year diploma, two year diploma in order to do black box testing for you. Okay, uh, let me just move on. So, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's derived from the formal specification. All right, it just tests the functionality, it doesn't test the internal operation of a, a program. It's usually known as functional testing as well. One of the biggest advantages of it is that you can start creating test cases. Um, before the implementation of the program. For example, we're gonna be creating a system about an ATM machine, All right, Here I am, I haven't even written one single line of code. I haven't even written a single design or a use case of the ATM machine. And yet I can think of a test case by just saying, all right, here's the situation. I have uh, 10,000 reals in the bank. I'm gonna withdraw 1,000 real. Uh, so the output should be an output of 1,000 real and a deduction of 1,000, meaning that the balance that I have it should be 9,000 reals at this point. Which, if you remember, as we mentioned in the last, le so two, two lectures ago, uh, it helps with correcting our understanding of the requirements in case there's a misunderstanding. So this leads to the second bullet point in saying that black box testing, it does help with getting the design and the coding uh, correct with respect to the specification. Uh, I just want to pause here for a second and just let you know that now, you know, I, you know, I'm getting a little better at this online thing and I can see the chat. Uh, so if you have any questions and you just want to type it, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. Uh, I'll be more than happy to, to answer that. All right, next up is white box testing. And white box testing is the opposite of black box testing in the sense that what I'm going to be testing, I will actually be looking at the internal operations of that unit. Okay. Now, when I say units, you ask, what, how big is that unit? That unit could be anything. Could be one line of code, could be a, a, a function, could be a class, um, could be a, a two classes together. It's whatever I define as a unit. Now, the point is judging and looking at the internals. So as you can see in this little flow chart, there is two branches that I can take and a loop. So I, my source for my test creation is that I want to have a test case that will execute the left branch of that flow chart and another one that executes the right branch of that flow chart. Okay, 
Now, obviously that makes it a lot more thorough. If we go back to black box testing, I have no idea what was inside that black box right there. So I could have come up with a whole bunch of test cases and assuming this is the same system as this one, but every single test case that I would have created only took the left hand side of that flow chart, which means I've never actually tested the right hand side of the branch, which means that in operation had someone for some reason triggered the right hand side of the flow chart, it could have triggered a hidden bug that is existing in there. Okay. So an advantage that white box testing has over uh, uh, black box testing is that it's a lot more thorough. Uh, but that doesn't mean that black box testing is, is, is a bad thing. Like I said before, one of the advantages that black box testing has over white box testing is that I can start right away by creating the test, which can help me with my misunderstanding, clarifies any misunderstanding, something that I cannot do with, with, with white box testing. So as you can see in white box testing, I have to have created the thing in order to actually know what is the internal structure of that thing that I've created in order to figure out what test cases I should be creating. Okay. Um, the other advantage that black box testing has over white box testing is that honestly, it's actually a lot cheaper. Okay. And part of the reason it's cheaper is because it's easier and because it's easier, I can hire people, you know, who are not so expensive that would require white box testing. All right. Uh, white box testing is sometimes known as uh, structural testing, all right? So let me just break away here from the screen for a second. Let's go over there, go back to the whiteboard. All right, so the main concept here, guys, all right, is that black box testing, I'm gonna look, I have no idea what's inside my unit, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read the requirements and based on it, I get to understand what these requirements are talking about. So based on the requirements, I start to figure out the inputs, okay? Uh, and what are the expected outputs and I can run the test as such. Now, with black box testing, I look at the unit, but then I look at what's the internals of the unit and it's the internals of the unit that gives me the idea to create the different inputs and along with it, the different outputs that I expected. Okay, so that's the difference between black box testing at the top, okay, and white box testing at the bottom. Okay, so going back here to my slide. Now, next up, what I wanna talk about is, is the different levels of testing, okay? High level, lower levels, and, and the like and detailed level. And we've seen, we've covered this very, very lightly when we talked about the V model of testing in the first chapter of this course. And basically the, the, the smallest level is what we call the unit level. Okay, so the, the unit level tends to be something like uh, um, a method, okay, or at most a class, all right, um, sometimes even as low as a line of code, okay. Again, there is no mathematical definition of how big of a unit, but basically that's kind of like the smallest concept that you don't want to break down any further, it would be autonomous whether it's a line of code, a couple of lines of code, a function or a couple of functions together, okay? Next up, we have a module. Again, unit and module tend to be interchanged and module tends to have a bigger name than the word unit. So if somebody says module, maybe a lot of the times that, that is referred to as a class. So you don't actually tend to hear the term module often, okay? So I can might as well just actually like cross that out right now and as though that doesn't exist. What you tend to hear about most is unit, integration, and system. Now, next up, we said integration, and the point behind integration is not to test 
one unit that is working correctly or another unit that is working correctly, but rather that the two units can talk to each other correctly, so they are integrating correctly. And if I would get all the units to talk to each other correctly and integrate correctly, in theory, this is what we call a system testing. So I am getting all the units to talk to each other to perform a system test, so in other words, a test at the system level. And when it, we're doing tests at the system level, we're actually executing the use cases. We're actually executing examples of usages of that system, the way a customer or a user of that system would get some sort of a benefit out of it, okay? In theory, Okay, it's actually at the same level. They have different terminologies because there is some slight differences between them, which we're gonna talk about in the next chapter, chapter four. Uh, so chapter four is all about acceptance testing. And um, so yeah, so that's at the three different levels. Okay, so as you look over here, so this will be the different units, method A, one, A2, B1, and B2, okay. You can say that the module could be the actual classes, all right? And again, honestly, usually we don't hear the term module testing in the industry quite a bit, okay? Next up is the integration. So you can see from those uh, maroon lines, I'm actually talking, we're testing those red lines connecting the different modules together. So that's integration testing. Last up is the system testing, testing the system as a whole as it is executing the actual uh, use cases, all right? Uh, now, I wanna stop here for a second and I go back again to the whiteboard. Let me just clear the canvas here. All right, so very, very important. We have, we say here, we, I, got, I got black box testing which we just mentioned a moment ago. And then we got white box testing over here. So there's the different types, yes? If you are writing something, we can't see what you write. Oh, it's not doing a screen share? No. no. Uh, just, did it disconnect or something? The PowerPoint uh, is what we see. Okay, so it's not disconnected, I know that. So how can I get, no, how, how can I get the controls to show back again? Yeah, yeah, I, I did the a hide thing, so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't bother me. Oh, it's Austin, I like it, I, I thought so. So uh, share, okay, there we go. So you see that now, guys? You yes. Oh, you're not in, okay. <laughs> Usually you play as a double agent, I heard from the yes. Nadal on the... <laughs> okay, so I didn't write much, luckily, alhamdulillah. So I, we said like, we got the different types of testing on this side. So the types on this side and the different, we're gonna have levels on this side. And in levels, we have unit, we have integration. I'm gonna skip module because they're really similar as unit. And then we said we have system. And again, I'm gonna skip acceptance testing, you know, just for now, because in theory, it's exactly the same thing as, as, as uh, system testing. Uh, now, I wanna ask, which one of those do you think is applicable to which? Black box testing, do you think it's applicable to unit, integration, or system? In theory, yeah, which one of those can I apply it to? System. Only system. Yeah. Uh, black box. So, yeah. So system I heard. I heard system. Integration. I heard one integration. Okay. So let me throw you a curveball. White box testing. Which one of those three on the right hand side do you think is applicable for? I mean, I'm not saying practice practically what you should do, but I'm just saying, what can you actually possibly do? Unit, integration, or, or system? All three. Actually, all three. And 
funny thing is that even with black box testing, the correct answer is all three as well. All right, it's all three as well. Now, let me just delete this for a moment. Okay, so had I had a, a unit over here and a unit over there, we said black box testing, I'm not gonna look inside, I'm just gonna look from the outside at the requirements. Whereas with white box testing, I'm gonna look on the inside, which is gonna derive my, my test case, okay? All right, fine. With integration testing, so that's kind of like my unit. I'm gonna put, so the output here becomes the input, and I'm gonna check for another output. And here with my next unit, I'm gonna look inside of it. Not only am I gonna look inside of it, but I'm also gonna look at the different ways they can interconnect. And then I'm gonna check the output. And this is the input, it's gonna turn into some sort of a, an output, gonna turn into some sort of an input. So I can do integration testing with white box testing and obviously black box testing. But then obviously, as I'm getting bigger, in order to figure out the different combinations, it's starting to get a lot more complicated, okay? So, um, so let me just erase this again, all right? Now, had I had two units over here, one and two, all right? The, here we got an, an if else thing, and I got a true, and then I got a false, all right? And then, in the second unit, I got another if else thing going on, and it can either go a true or it could go a false. So another branch, all right? In order to do white box testing on this, all right, I need to analyze both components and how both components can end up, uh, actually, let's, let me do it in order to, because um, the mathematically is gonna be the same. Let's just say we have a case statement. Uh, let's, because if else is mathematics is gonna end up being the same. I have a case and I got A, case A, case B, case D, and then you got another case, um, D, E, and F, all right? Now, with black box, with black box, I could have just stayed with the F and L statement. Uh, never mind. I actually could have just created one, because I'm, I, I'm completely oblivious to what's going on over here. I have no idea that these units have a case statement inside or even an if else statement to begin with. All I know is my requirements document over there. And so based on my requirements document, I could have just created the one test case. Here's my input and I checked for my output and, and I feel like I'm done, okay? But if I have, I'm gonna do white box testing. Now I'm forced to look at what's inside. Okay, and now I need to look at the different combinations of routes that it can take. So it could have taken um, an A, D, A, E, A, F. I could have been a, you know, a such as such. Okay, a C, D, C, E, C, F. If you do the math, that's actually nine different test cases. All right, obviously that is a lot more thorough than the one test case that I had over here. So as I'm getting bigger, all right, the number of test cases are starting to increase rather astronomically versus if I was doing it with black box testing. In other words, black box testing, I could have brought all the units together with just the one case, but with white box testing, I would have to look at the internals of each one and look at the different combinations. And now had this second unit been connected to another one with another case, okay, with uh, EFG, H and I, all right, exactly. So how many test cases would that be? 27, exactly, Abdurrahman just beat you to it, okay? So that's 27. And again, with black box testing, I could have just literally just done the whole thing with one test, all right? So back again to what we had before. So we had black box testing here, and we got white box testing over there, and we got, um, you said unit, integration, and we got system. Practically what happened, okay, is that we look at the unit in quite a lot of detail with white blocks testing, okay. With the system as a whole, I tend to just close my eyes a little bit and just test the whole thing. And with integration, it's somewhere in the middle. So 
at the earlier levels of integration, if I'm just integrating a couple of units together, then maybe white box testing. So white, if I'm integrating a whole bunch of units together, not the whole system yet, then I would probably do black box testing. So if I'll just complete this, so this is still applicable here, and that would have been applicable over there. Now, the whole concept behind this, and this is what happens in every industry, not just the software industry. If you look at something like Mercedes Benz, what it does is a car has a million units, okay? What they do is they bring each one of these units and they test it very, very, very thoroughly, i.e. white box testing, and making sure that that unit on its own is performing its job well. Yes, they're doing integration testing later on, but at some point when they put the whole car together, they're not looking at say, how are the forces propagating through every single unit in my car? They're just looking at how is the car performing as a whole when I turn left, when I turn right, when I go back and when I go frontward. So they're doing black box testing in this case. And, and the concept here is that the, the philosophy is that if I have checked every single unit on its own and is working correctly, the, the hope is that when I put it all together, all right, then it should be working correctly as well. Okay, so guys at home, uh, is this concept clear? Or do you have any questions about this? Okay, clear, okay, good, good, good. All right, so I'm gonna go back then to the slides. We got this one. All right, there we go, back again. Where is this thing? So we finish that. All right, and I, I'm not gonna go into much this slide again too much because we already covered this is the V model. And on this side over here, we're looking at the different levels of testing. And the point is, uh, I've actually created the, uh, the high level before I created the test at the lower levels and the lower levels and the lower levels. All right, but then after I've completed my coding, then the actual test that I execute begin from the lower levels up and up and up to the higher levels, all right? The source for each one of those levels depends on the different development life cycle phase that I'm in. So my acceptance test should be prompted by my requirement uh, my system uh, and architecture and design and module design today together should give me my uh, system test. And finally, the module design should give me my unit test until I've actually finished and, and done the coding. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I should have just actually from now on just because every, every year I say that, that it really just about the same. I, it's very uncommon to hear the term module testing, okay? It usually just goes unit integration and system, okay? All right, so, so we've so covered can this. The, can you go back this to one? the V slide? Yes, Dr. This one? Yes, uh, yes this one. This one, okay. No, no, the V model. Yes. Uh, in this example, uh, V model, uh, do we only use the black box test testing because we didn't implement anything before the coding phase? How are we going to to perform the as work? we're going yeah as we're going down as we're going down yeah yeah Abdurrahman we're creating the the black box tests but we're not actually executing the black box test because we don't actually have the code ready okay mm -hmm. now what I was trying to say is that you can't perform the actual black box test before the coding, but you can create the test. Now, you're gonna ask, why is this any useful for me? Because from day one, I could have confirmed or clarified any misunderstanding. So let's just say, Abdurrahman, you were trying to explain to me uh, uh, some function, a very simple something, I'm not getting it. So I told you if I give it a three and a three, it gives me a nine, you correct me and say, no, no, you, doctor, you got this wrong this is the multiplication you're talking about, a three and a three should have given me a six, okay? Now, with white box testing, I can't clarify this much understanding at the earlier phases of development. I have to wait until the end 
when I've actually created the code in order to, to show you the mistake that I've done. And it's good news, bad news. I was like, yeah, it's good news that I've found the mistake, but it's bad news. I've already wasted a lot of effort and a lot of time to get to this phase. Okay. Yeah, Abdurrahman? Yes, so we usually start by making the black box test. Exactly. And I use the black box test to create my acceptance test as we see and as we will discuss in a lot of details in the next chapter. Okay. okay? And, and, you know, as I'm going down the system level, the design, the high level design, going down to the lower level design, then I keep creating more tests. All right. And there's still black box because I don't have anything created just yet. Okay, maybe at this the design level now I can see a flow chart. All right, I can begin now creating some white box tests, but I can't execute. Here's the keyword: execute any test, black box or white box, unless I actually have code. That's the whole concept about testing. Okay, it's not that that I get the requirements understood correctly or not. It's just about did this thing that I actually create that I build it right. It's the verification thing. Okay. So is the code that I've created, does it have the same exact mental model as I've expected? Or is there a misalignment between what I have in my mind about what this code does and what this code actually does? All right. All right. So moving on. So professor aren't the dashed arrows between the test to the right and reverse. Uh, now, oh yeah, that, that actually should, should be going upstairs. Yeah. That's, that's a good catch. You know, that's the first time anybody. Yeah. So after the coding, oh, I think what it's trying to say is that the unit test is applied to the coding and then integration is applied after the unit and then the system test is actually applied. So you're right, but I, I understand, I probably, I think I understand what the, um, what, what, what this slide is trying to say is that the unit test is applied so that the error is going from the unit test to the coding. And then um, it's trying to say that integration test is following unit test. Okay, who's that, Ibrahim? Is that, does that make sense? So, but, but nonetheless, the order is, you're correct. Okay, so unit, then integration, then system, and then acceptance. What about the what? Left side, now the left side here, this is a development life cycle. Okay, so it's our regular R, D, I, you know, work that we do. Uh, let me just go back here again. Any, again, any, any, any questions about this? All right. All right, so uh, more terminology. Okay, um, so we got regression testing. This is a situation where I'm testing something that I've already tested before. And that's usually because when some unit has changed, every other unit that is dependent on this unit needs to be checked as well. Okay. So here I am, I got a unit and I, I know I've checked it and I, I think it's fine. Okay. But in reality, this unit is dependent on a different unit. And at some point I want to obviously check that unit and make sure it's correct. But if this function over here is calling the function over there, then um, first time around, obviously I wanna make sure they're integrating correctly that you know, function one is calling function two correctly. But if something changes in function two, obviously first thing I wanna do is retest function two, but then although nothing has happened in the first unit that has function one, I wanna go back again and test that because there's a dependency between them. You see that dependency? So it's a situation where well, I don't know what I've done that I've changed in function two in the second unit might have affected me and my first unit. So my first unit worked correctly before, but now the new change, I don't know how it's gonna work now. And along with it, every other unit that the dependency chain is going to, okay? So all of this would be my regression testing. I have to do all of that. Next term, I'm not gonna get into it quite in detail because it's really, we're gonna, it's the topic of our next lecture, which is acceptance testing. And it's something that is done after we have completed testing in-house and we take the system to the, uh, the deployment site, to the actual customer and we deploy it over there and we test it over there for the 
customer to quote unquote accept it. And this is hence the term acceptance testing is coming from. Uh, now, uh, acceptance testing, okay, you, you, well, it's not the same, okay? So, uh, acceptance testing has two sides of it, okay? So, I'm going back here over here. So, what I'm doing, when I'm creating the test in acceptance testing, I'm doing validation. Oh, mute. <laughs> okay, I, I should have fixed it now. So, I, oh, sorry, sorry again. Can, can you hear me? <laughs> I sound yes. like the Verizon guy. Okay, good, good. So we're back here. And uh, I think the mistake that I've done is that I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I was using the, the university's Wi-Fi. I forgot to close the Wi-Fi and use the 4G instead. So I apologize for the little hiccup over there. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure how much you've gotten of what I was saying, so I don't hear in the class. So he's asking me about acceptance testing, and I was telling him it's if what we're doing before we actually do the development at the very, very beginning, that's a validation activity, but the acceptance testing that we do after the system testing, in other words, after we've had the system done and completed and delivered to the customer site, is actually a verification activity that we're trying to make sure that it is actually built correctly. All right, so all tests, at the end of the day, they boil down to creating test cases. A test case is composed of values, okay, um, uh, some expected results. And we set some prefix values and postfix values. So the prefix values are the values are, that, that are coming before the actual values, and they tend to set up the environment. The postfix values, they're not the actual outputs, but rather the, 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 the outputs that I'm expecting, or the, the um, the thing that I'm expecting to put to the system in order to leave it at a stable state before I just exit. Um, necessary for a complete execution and evaluation of the software under test. The word software under test, a lot of the time is, is abbreviated to SUT. So quite often you'll hear the term SUT, that means software under test. A test set is simply a, a, a set of tests, sometimes referred to quite a, a commonly as a test suite. Okay, some people will refer to a test suite, maybe even as a set of sets. Okay, uh, different uh, things change. Now, um, here we, we, we've come to a very, very important part of the lecture and about testing in general. It's called coverage criteria. Big, big, big part of this course is talking about coverage criteria and all the while we're gonna keep talking criteria, criteria, criteria. you're gonna hear me refer to this term over and over and over term, again and again, coverage criteria, okay? So we wanna define a model of the software, usually in a graphical form, and then find different ways to cover it. So what I need in order to cover it, and the way I said is this is what we call test requirement. And then a test criteria is a collection of these rules, and a process that defines those test requirements. Okay. So together, 
given a set of test requirements, TR. Now, from now on, every time you see something with a capital, that means it's a set of small little TRs, okay? So I have a set of test requirements, TR, for a coverage criterion C. Oh, wow, both of them just went down together at the same time. For a coverage criterion C, uh, and a test set of T, so little tests, would satisfy the criteria if and only if for every test requirement TR at least one test T exists in such a way that it satisfies every single TR. Now that probably made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Okay. And that's absolutely normal. Every year we do the same thing. Let me just discard this. All right. So I'm going to be going back and forth quite a bit with this now for a moment. All right, so here we are. I have a criteria, okay, big C, okay? And the criteria, in order to do it, I realize no, no, I have... I not seeing the whiteboard. On again, sorry. All right. Thank you, uh, Abdurrahman, for notifying me. So I have the criteria, okay? And, and I realized in order to satisfy the criteria, I need certain things to be done, okay? Those certain things to be done, we call test requirements, small little TRs. Okay, so in order to satisfy that criteria, and that criteria could be, just for now, we call it level one, level two, level three, level four. And level one is weaker than level two and weaker than level three. So you can imagine where I'm going with this. And you can imagine had say level one required four requirements, four little TRs, probably level two would require six, level three would require eight, level four would require 10 and so on. Okay. so. I have my test requirements. And now here I am. I got my, my software under test. This is my code. What I do is I can create a whole bunch of test cases, right? So test case one with its input and output. Then I got test case two with its, oops, with its input and output and so on. Okay. So I'm creating with a capital T a set of test cases. Okay, now hopefully, as I'm executing those test cases, they are satisfying some of the requirements. Now, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping, okay? For example, this test case could be doing, covering this TR. This test case covers those two over here, okay? This test case ends up covering this one over here and this one over here, which means kind of like this one was rather useless because it's already covering something that I already had covered. That's okay, at this point. I've just wasted some effort and some time, okay? Now, assuming this test case and that test case covered the same ones over there, okay? That means that in total, I have not covered every single test requirement, which means I have not satisfied my test criteria. Now, had I created one last test case over here, which luckily would have covered my last test requirement, and only then have I had a 100% completion of my test requirements, then I can actually say that I've covered level one of my criteria. So my criteria level one, I would have covered that. All right, guys at home, is this clear? Uh, doctor, by saying uh, covering 100%, that does not necessarily mean that we covered every possible path, but we covered the requirement. No, 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 not exactly. Look, so, so Abdurrahman is, was asking a very good question. He's saying, you know, if we've covered the TRs 100%, that doesn't mean we've covered every single fact. No, not necessarily. Okay. So as I was saying, Abdurrahman, we have coverage criteria and the criteria come in different strengths. Okay. So think about it. Level one, level two, level three. And level one is weak. 
Level two is a bit stronger. Level three is a bit stronger. Okay. Maybe we're talking about level one. Yeah, that doesn't actually cover all the different paths. Okay. But nonetheless, خلاص, this is the coverage criteria that I, because I don't have a lot of money. I don't want to, I don't have a lot of time. So I want something, you know, the, the least level for some reason. Okay. So uh, I've created the criteria and I realized in order to satisfy that criteria, this is the different requirements that I have. And so I create a whole bunch of test cases to satisfy the requirements and such. Now, like I said, Abdurrahman, had I wanted a more thorough level of testing, okay, and say, like you said, cover every single path, okay, I would have probably required, say, coverage criteria level three, Masana, or level even four, which would have required not just the four TRs that you see in front of you on the screen, but would require probably eight or 10 or 15, which naturally, naturally, should require more tests to be created as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, obviously, you'd be very, very clever to minimize the amount of work by creating test cases that hit more birds with the same stone. Okay. So, in other words, had I created one test case that covered or satisfied all four test requirements, then I would have done an extremely, extremely good job, all right? Because I'm not wasting, I'm actually establishing a certain level of confidence by satisfying that criteria, but I've just done it in a lot less work. I mean, if we're targeting the same level of coverage criteria, and I created one test case to do it, you created 100, Marish, I've done a better job than you because I'm not wasting everybody's efforts with the other 99 who are still covering the same requirement. All right, so let me go back to uh, my slide over here. Now, hopefully things will get better as we go to the next slide, okay? So let's just say we have that example over here. We have uh, a football field, okay? And we got four players, player one, two, three, and four. We got football field, and we've divided the football field into different cells. A1 to A13, and so on, and Bs and Cs and Ds, all right? Um, and let's just say the different players would run this way. This is the way player one runs. This is the way player two runs, just straight down the field. This is the way player three runs, and this is the way player four runs, okay? Let's assume that the actual field is my software under test. That is my software under test. and um, the players are actual test cases. What happens when you execute a test case? You give it an input, okay? So the input could be player four, and we're gonna begin at one point in the field, and then as it's executing, it's going through the different path, and then it has to exit the code at a certain point, okay? Which is kind of like what we do in SE100. You give an input, you know where that input is coming in, and you can follow line by line what else is being executed because of that input until you hit the return statement that stops everything. And you can see this is the exit point of my code. All right. Now, the premise is I want to cover. Okay. And this is where the word coverage comes from. I want to cover parts of the field because in one of those cells or even more, there is a bug. All right. There is a bug. So let's just say I have created four test cases, those four players over here, okay? And um, how much of that field, how much of that field did those players cover, okay? So let's just begin very, very simple. Guys at home, do the math. How many parts of the field? Obviously, they didn't cover the entire field. Okay, so the entire field is filled by 13 multiplied by four cells. How many of those cells were covered by those four tests, those four players? I'll wait for an answer. Okay, so I don't know what do you think. All right, out of the 52, so 13 multiplied by four is 52, so? 
right? Yeah, okay. So 42 were covered. I'm assuming this is correct. I didn't really count, okay? Now, so here you said, uh, who was that that said that? Abdurrahman said 42. Now, going back again to this thing that I was talking about, coverage criteria. Let's just say my coverage criteria was to cover every cell once. Someone has to have come across a patch of this field, a cell of this field, at least once. That means that the withdrawal force, what the four players have done, they didn't actually cover that coverage criteria, okay? The test requirements for that coverage criteria is that A1, A2, A3, and A4, and so on would have been, sorry, touched, okay? And the test cases, I've covered 42 divided by 52, which is 81%. Thank you, Abdurrahman, perfect timing. So that's 51%. Now, let's just say, and just to give you an idea of what I'm trying to say about uh, uh, um, more thorough testing, fine. If there is a bug, all right, that's in cell A3, Okay, there is nobody that even come by A3. Okay, so we have very oh, zero chance of actually catching it. Fine. Let's just say we have a bug in C2. Okay, yeah, we have somebody who passed on that. Now, very important distinction that we have to make, not because a test case have covered this path, and a player have one through C2, that means they'll, they'll find that bug. Assume the bug is kind of like a ring that somebody dropped in that field. You can walk through it, not find it. Very likely, okay? All right. Um, now, if this cell was dropped, sorry, if this ring was dropped in C7, we had two people come across C7. So a higher likelihood that we would find it. Let's just say we, that that thing was dropped in B7. We have three people. Again, had that ring was dropped in B7, we would have had a much, much stronger chance of getting it. So in other words, passing through the same patch over and over again uh, is a, a much more thorough way of doing my testing than just passing over once or twice or even zero. Okay, so I can establish my criteria as such. So I can say level one is pass through every patch once, which will result in a set of little TRs. TR1 would be get through A1. TR2, get to A2. TR3, get to A3, and so on. Okay, so that'll be coverage level criteria one. And the four tests that I have didn't even cover my first one. But how much did it cover? 81%, okay? Now, let's just say we've gone through, we wanna do level two. And level two says that I want every patch to be covered twice. So something like A1, my criteria was not satisfied in A1 because it was covered just the one. Can somebody do the math and say, out of 52, how, how many cells were actually covered at least twice or more? Okay, so I can see player two, the entire pass, so we got, we got 13 and then we got C13, C yeah, C7. So that's 15. So 15 divided by 52 is how much, Ibrahim? How much? 15 divided by 50 is how much, how many, how much percent? 28.8, okay. So for the same exact test cases, the same four players running the same four routes, 28.8, thank you, Ibrahim. Um, my satisfaction of the stronger criteria is actually less than my weaker criteria. So despite not actually covering either of them, still the four that I've done 
have satisfied a bigger percentage of a criteria level one, the weaker one versus criteria number two. And let's just even let's go to the nth level here, uh, criteria level three, which says that every patch should be covered three times. Uh, with the naked eye, I can just see there's only B7, so that's one out of 52. I mean, we're talking about 1% here. So, level, so you can see how it drops that from 82% to 28 to 1%. And if I go to level four, say in four times, I don't think there's any cell here that was covered four times. So that means that every, all the effort that I've done covered 0% satisfaction of my coverage criteria. Okay, that's the general concept of coverage criteria which we will be looking at so much in the course throughout this course. All right, so here's the math. Um, and it shows, you know, uh, at the bottom here, it says like, how, what's the coverage level if player one ran only, what if player two and three ran? And we got different examples, okay? In other words, what if we just ran test two and three? What if we ran test one and three and so on? And what if all the players ran and so on, okay? All right, the last part of this chapter, I need you to pay attention to this, okay? I can guarantee you there's a quiz coming up on that one. <laughs> um, so we have some very important definitions that tend to be interchanged quite often in the world of software because people just don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and uh, those terms are software fault, error and failure. Now, a fault is basically a bug in the system, the line in the code that has the issue. An error is when that fault is executed, but resulting in an invalid state. But an invalid state that has not been exposed to the world outside. And had it been exposed to the world outside, this is what we call a software failure, okay? Now, again, everybody tends to nod their head saying, yes, very clear, but they probably don't really know what they are agreeing to, okay? So we have something, a line called, uh, this, this, this is a square function. Okay, and the 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 code is going x. Uh, we can't see the whiteboard, professor. Oh, again, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I have a square function, and the code is going x. Uh, you know, equals uh, x plus um, x multiplied by x, so which goes an asterisk. No, actually, that's that, that is that is a square function. <laughs> sorry. Uh, x equals x multiplied by two. Okay, classic case, all right. So what is the fault? The fault is right over here, okay. The correct answer is supposed to be x multiplied by x, okay. So if I got the input being x, okay, so the square of it should be x multiplied by x, all right. So this is what I call the fault. Now we got two things. I got error and I got something called failure. And error is dependent on an incorrect state, which is inside, so that's an error. And if that incorrect state manifests itself outside, then this is where we have a failure, okay? In order to understand what I'm talking about, we got to look at the word state here more carefully. Okay. Now, state in just simple Arabic translation means wada. Okay. If I ask you, what's the state of your bank account? In other words, I'm asking you how much money you actually have in your bank account. Uh, I have uh, my balance, I mean, sorry. 
I got 10,000 reals. Okay, that's my, that's my balance. So that's a state. If I had a balance of, oops, a thousand, no, oh, it was 1,000, 10,000. If I had 10,001, in theory, that's a different state. In theory, that's a different state. In other words, I could have actually been applying to a credit card saying, if you have in the bank 10,000 and less, you don't get the credit card. If you have in the bank 10,000 and one or more, then you get the credit card. So in theory, those two numbers are two different states. And basically in general, the holding on to a variable in general is a state, okay? And if I have two variables, A and B, if I have two variables, A and B, and A could take two values, zero and one, B can take two values, zero and one, okay? Then in any point of my code, as it's running, if A was zero and B was zero, that's a state. And if A was one, B was zero, that's another state, okay? And you can get the point zero and one, and then finally one and one, so that's three different states. So every value of a variable is a state, but not just that, but every combination of values of a variable is, of the variables is another state, okay? So a state is a particular value that a variable has or a, a variable have, sorry. Let me just clear this again here. And guys at home, are you following me on this so far? Yes. Okay, good, good. Now, in that square function that we had before, okay, and I have x equals x uh, multiplied by two, okay. Had the input been two, okay, the output to be calculated is four, okay? Now, the result of this line, which is supposed to be doing my square stuff for me, although it happened by mistake, the true answer was still a four, okay? So this x over here, let's just actually call it a different value. I'm gonna just call it a z, just to be, just to be clear. So Z was expected to be four, and Z turned out to be four, okay? So although there's a fault, and although the fault was executed, somehow I have not even resulted in some sort of an incorrect state, an incorrect variable value. Still Z was calculated correctly, Taban with you know, alhamdulillah, you know, Rabbina Satarfi. Basically, that's what it is. So, the, the fault have executed, but the error was not formed. All right? Now, now, if I given an input of three, that automatically exposes a lot. So I would say that the expected value was nine, but what was actually produced was six, okay? Now, not because the moment it got executed means me sitting outside have already seen what's going on. It's still inside. Okay, so he is having the value of six and that's an incorrect state. So we know we've got the error. I know I've got the error. Had that six been exposed to me outside, I would have received a failure. Okay, type. Let's go back again here and show 
expose this whole failure thing here, okay? Let's just say I have two lines of code, one of which, so two branches of my code, one of which is doing the square thing, and it produced the six when, remember, it should have produced the nine, okay? Another branch, completely independent, is computed a number, say, 15. And together, they think here in some sort of an else statement and says, whatever number is bigger, then I'll put it to the screen outside to the user who's looking at this and says, all right, well, I got the 15. So what happened is that I have an internal state, an incorrect internal state that somehow got masked and from the person looking outside, all right, they didn't see it. They didn't see it. So that's a situation where fault got executed, an error was formed, but a failure did not happen. A failure did not happen, okay? Now, how can I make this fault be exposed so much so that the failure is actually showing, all right? I could have given it a different input to the square function. Let's just say um, a five, okay? So the five, the five, uh, when it was multiplied by two, gave me a 10, okay? Which is what is gonna be getting compared to the 15, but really it should have produced a 25 because that's the five squared. And so when the 10 and the 15 getting compared, the output that I'm gonna be getting is 15, when in reality, the output that I should have been getting is 25. All right, so with that, I created a test case, and this is what we want. This is the most important part, is to get those test cases to execute the fault. Obviously, to reach the fault, that's one thing. But reaching the fault doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna expose the bug. So I wanted to reach the fault, which executes, which forms an error, which then manifests itself in the form of a failure later on. And this is what I was talking about in the last slide when I was showing the players running through the field, meaning that one particular value could have executed the fault. In other words, they could have ran through that patch in the field. However, just by sheer luck, it didn't actually form an internal error which didn't actually form a failure. Obviously, 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 and this is a rule of thumb, uh, you cannot have an error unless you've actually executed a fault, okay? And you cannot have a failure unless you have formed an error to begin with, okay? There's no such thing as you go in from a fault to a failure. Now. Very, very often, very, very often, you have a situation like we had over here, and you don't actually have a second branch like this, okay? You only have that one line, one branch. In other words, there was no safety net to mask, okay? So any mistake, any number other than two, any number other than two, or probably even zero, okay? Uh, one, not that one would have caused an error because one multiplied by two would give me a two, okay? So zero and a two, anything else would have exposed the error into a failure. In other words, I wouldn't, there's, had I had one branch in my code only, which is this branch, I'm faced in a situation where there is no way that I can have a test case that produces an error, but doesn't mask itself, sorry, manifest itself into being a failure at some point. 
this is very, very common. And unless, like I said, you have that other branch on this side, all right, you have no help. Okay, you cannot mask, you cannot have a situation where you have the error, but it didn't manifest itself into being a fault, a failure. Okay. So assume a program that uses a larger value resulting from the, this is the exact same example. We just covered that. Okay. Uh, now here's a little exercise. Uh, exercise one, it says find the last. So it basically, I've taken an array of integers called X. I'm looking for a number Y and we want to find the last instance in that array that, um, that is equal to Y. Okay. Um, Typically, the question you get in some exercise is the, 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 the set of four that you see, identify the fault, identify a test case that doesn't execute the fault, identify a test case that executes the fault but not an error, and then one that executes the fault results in an error but not a failure, and then finally something that executes an error, a uh, sorry, fault, then results in an error which leads to a failure. Okay, so we know what the fault is. Oh, sorry, looking at this code over here, um, we have a for loop. What is the fault in this piece of code? What is the fault in this piece of code? is larger than zero. And I equals, okay, so we're beginning from the end. Yeah, yeah, I is larger than, this is not, and it's supposed to be what, yeah, Abdurrahman? Uh, less than or equal. Less than or equal, uh, larger, all right. Larger or equal. So yeah, larger than or equal, <laughs> okay, so that, and, and the reason this is a fault, Abdurrahman, is because, can you say it's that static. out loud? It's static. Static, yeah, I need static. It's static code. It's not, uh, it hasn't been run yet. No, 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 no. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not what I and meant. I mean, why, why is this a problem? Why is the I not being greater than or equal to zero a problem? Uh, because indexing starts at zero. Not one. Exactly. So that means that when I am checking the code, so the way this code is running, okay, I got my array. This is index zero, one, two, three, four, and we're beginning from the end and we're going as such. Okay. But now with the last one, all right, with, with I being greater than zero, that means it will never check this. Now it's very important that we have a mental understanding of the error because with it we get to under we get to be able to answer every single question later on okay now the first question as like i said is usually it says identify a test case that doesn't execute the fault in other words i want to take something that takes me outside the branch to begin with so i want something that makes me not execute this right i'm just going to give you the hint for this time around usually you'll see a line like this that some sort of a null pointer exception happens here so if i've given uh and an, an empty array or array that is pointing to nothing, then it's just gonna skip all of this. So I'm not actually gonna execute that line to begin with and I'm out, okay? Now, next question says, execute the fault, but do not result in an error. How can we do that? When I say that, I mean, give me a, t a situation, a test case of an array X and a value for Y that will execute the fault, but not result in an error. Now, when we identify the fault, we said that the problem is that we're not checking the last one. So the first one, 
Okay. Now, something that executes, now we're dealing with the array, but at the same time, we don't want to be reaching the last one because the last one is where it gets tricky. Okay. So I would want to come up with a value, okay, to be found somewhere before we get to that cell number zero. Let's even put it in cell number three. Okay. So I put a value in messenger like 10 in cell number four. Okay, and the Y that I'm looking for is a 10. So it's just gonna find it. Okay, we're not my All right. Now, um, let us, uh, uh, here's another situation. I'm gonna skip four for now. I'm gonna go to five. Identify a test case that will execute the fault, which results in an error, which then results in a failure. I'm gonna give you a moment to think about this one. It's very easy. Uh, if the last number is at index zero. All right. All right. So, so I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, and and X, you, you're given both, you, you identify. So when if somebody gives you, ask you for a test case, you define all the inputs, okay? And I think the battery is gonna shut down here really quickly. Now, our way of thinking is we identified the fault. First time around, I was avoiding it. Next time, now I'm actually trying to get to it, okay? I'm actually trying to get to it. So I want to have a value that obviously doesn't show anything before, because if it showed over here, then it's just going to use that value over here and cell number two. So I don't want that. I want anything else. And I'm it could be a, a, a one, two, three. I don't care, but it just doesn't have 11. And that the Y that I'm looking for is the 11. And then it would look through it and say, well, I didn't find it. Okay. No, it's there. You just didn't look for it, okay? And I think because the thing is, is running down, this, unfortunately, also this exercise, when we look at question number four, we will not be able to find a situation where we can mask it. So it's not possible to have, to have an error without it leading to a failure later on, okay? So unless I had a situation like this over here, where I have a different branch that can mask the error that's resulting from here, then the failure will always show, okay? There is an exercise number two that I strongly suggest that you do, okay? Because we, I wanna begin with the next chapter and the next exercise. So please do that next exercise. And I can guarantee you there's gonna be a quiz about this. So do the exercise, train yourself, um, I, I think maybe I have another exercise or two uh, on my computer that maybe I can post for you to do in the class as well, or sorry, you can do it at home so you could be ready for, for your quiz. Okay. So any questions guys, before I stop the recording? Any questions at home? You, you can just type, say no. Everything is clear. Clear, Doctor. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll I'll see you two days from now on Wednesday, inshallah. Thank you.